There's many different pronunciations throughout the times, uh, many different cultures saying different ways, but I think the proper way to say it is, baby, I drive a Jag. Hey. I had to rent another car for another work trip, so this time we have a 2019 Jaguar F-Pace. It's been over 10 years since Ford sold them off to Tata Motors, so thankfully that means that this car in no way resembles a Ford Explorer, much like the old Jags all resembled Ford Tauruses. While under Ford, Jaguar never made a profit. Tata Motors was a saving grace for the company, turning a half a billion dollar loss into over a three billion dollar profit within only seven years of ownership. Tata Motors understood what the brand Jaguar meant to auto enthusiasts, and they sought to revive that passion. This specific F-Pace is their 30T all-wheel drive prestige model. While it may not be packing the V6 or the V8, it does come very well feature equipped, as it should, for $55,000. Now, don't confuse the rear end for a Mazda. How dare you? It's a Jag. Both the revised Mazda CX-9 and the F-Pace were introduced in 2016, and the designs are strikingly similar. I'm not saying one copied the other here, but it's worth mentioning. Despite that fact, this does have some sharp lines for an SUV. The rear end sticks with the taillight design of one of my favorite little sports cars out today, the F-Type. The dual tailpipes, spoiler, and extended lights that bleed over the quarter panel give it a full and somewhat aggressive look from the back. The luxury feel here is plenty present. They didn't skimp on materials or build quality throughout the interior. There's a good flow going on in here. Now let's get to the drive so I can show you how all of this comes together to be a proper jag. It's a silly feature, but and it might break at one point and you won't be able to shift into gear. But their transmission selector here, their little gear selector, when you turn the car on, it is presented to you in a fashion that says, I'm fancy. This, I assume, would one day break, thus leaving you to like turn it inside of itself to try to get it into gear. But while it's working, it looks great. I just accidentally found this out. When you lower the music all the way, it pauses it for you. All right, that's smart. Son of a bee. So now that my gear selector has been presented to me, I mean, what I do is I always, it's a rental. I go straight into S, I go right into the checkered flag, and I floor it. We're gonna start off in normal mode though. So this comes with a lot of nice features in it. The interior does feel fit and finish. It is quiet. I took a five hour drive again to Albany. It was actually a very nice ride. I found it to be nicer than the Mercedes-Benz I drove previously, the GLC 300. It also does come in a nice $10,000 higher, but that's more so for the package. If you get the baseline model, this is actually a similar priced model. Even in the normal mode, it's got some kick to it. And since I'm in an SUV with giant tires, I don't slow down for any bumps. I'm an animal. This does come packing an inline four-cylinder engine turbo. I gotta say, I'm very impressed with what four-cylinder turbos are doing these days. They do hold their own weight. We've gotten very good at tailoring a small engine to do a lot of work, especially in a larger car. So just to do it, let's put it in S mode. Already it dropped one gear. We're gonna put it in the checkered flag mode. We're in dynamic mode confirmed. That's what it says on the dash. And then, ooh, it downshifted its eight gear transmission pretty smoothly. This is a ZF transmission, so this thing just shakes and moves. Giant brakes on this thing. Watch this brake test, watch this. Oh my god, that shit. I'll turn your head sideways. The sound in the back is really nice. When we're in this race mode here, that grumble is lively. That grumble comes up hard. And I do like the, the sunroof here, this, this full panoramic sunroof really does open up the inside with light. Uh, and at night, you know, you get a good um, look at the moon while you're driving at 104 miles an hour on 87. If you've seen any of my previous videos, physical buttons are the way to go when it comes to climate control. However, I was trying to get the fog, it got steamy in this puppy, and I was trying to just defrost everything, so I pressed the max button, that gets way too loud, so let's minimize that immediately. And then I spent the next 10 minutes trying to figure out how to turn it off, and I could not figure it out. I ended up just pressing every button until something happened, and what I noticed is 
when you try to change the direction of the air and you hit your little sitting guy here, in the middle of your car on the digital display is a power button. So I, I'm not even gonna get into how bad these displays are these days. This is one of the better ones, but it still has stupid features like that where you have to clamor around to find some basic options that you should be able to find simply. I plugged my Android phone in to see if it had Android Auto and it didn't. But it does have this in-touch apps or something like that. It's got this proprietary thing. All it ever did was ask me, do you want to use your in-touch apps? And it kept popping up. I, at one point, I couldn't even get it off the screen. All I wanted to do was charge my phone while I used Waze. On the heads-up display here, it does look very good. The graphics are nice. They're clean, laid out quite well inside of there. I do like when you're on your sport mode, and especially with the checkered flag, and you start switching gears. The gear is a giant number right in the middle, and it'll invert its colors once you hit the end of the rev band to tell you to upshift. The one thing was I could not figure out how to switch between information screens. Turned out at the end of the stalk, there's a button that has an eye. So when I pressed that, I thought the whole thing would change, but instead just the small right hand quadrant of that display changes its information. From there, you get your miles per gallon trip monitor and all that, but that's it. Everything else about the car itself, the options for the car itself, are changed through the menu in this screen here. So it does have this lane assist thing. And in my head, I was like, am I gonna get to take a nap on my five hour drive? Absolutely not. All it really does is detect that there are lines on either side. I don't know if it's activating maybe like ABS a little bit, but it really gives the car a big thudding feeling like you're actually hitting the rumble strip on the side of the road. And it really makes you know that, oh crap, I'm out of my lane. The only problem with that I found was if you're in a construction zone or there's multiple painted lines, so in, in one case they were repainting lines, it was just going nuts. The thing couldn't detect what lane I was in. Rightfully so, it sees multiple lines and it thinks I've gone out of one. It's easy enough to turn on and off right here. I, I did feel a little pompous driving this car to the point of where even like, excuse you, I'm gonna jag, I go first. It gives you it gives you a bad attitude but even as i get onto this parkway here i'm honestly not even touching the gas much i'm just laying my foot onto it and this thing just becomes an absolute animal and for an suv like this look at that i'm not full throttle and this thing will go to the ends of the earth to reach the max red line it's 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 alarmingly satisfying and even at high speeds, this car is quiet. It's like I don't even hear the wind hitting it. The steering wheel feels really good in your hands too. The steering is spot on. For a big car, there's not a lot of body roll going on in it. I feel like I'm in absolute control of this thing as I drive it. I do like a lot of the ambient light that you're getting in here. It really has a way of just opening up the interior. Not like it's not big enough, but it really does work well. The design of the car is actually really nice. The only thing that's extremely stupid are the window controls being up here. Uh, a friend of mine actually mentioned how water can easily seep from the window into this control panel and short it out. I'm unaware of the consistency of that, but I can see it as an option. Just why are your window switches here and your seat switches here? I'm not changing my seats so often that I need my memorized seats below here. I feel like that could have been switched, but then to have, if the seats were up here, I would have criticized that as well. And on the passenger side, there's only a lock button, so the passenger cannot unlock the doors, then the window switches above it. So at least the window switches are consistently in a stupid area. As far as the transmission selector, it's a weird way to use up this much real estate in the center, but at least their flow is accurate in that your transmission is here and then your drive modes and everything are here. So everything that has to do with driving is here. Everything that has to do with climate is here. And then everything that has to do with entertainment or navigation is in this infotainment center. The graphics here are nice. It is extremely smooth. The responsiveness is very good. So uh, this is very nice streamlined into the dashboard. The plastics do work very well. I do like the, the design of this at night, especially it has this on the Prestige model, you get this ambiance feature. So you get these little lights on the door, you get the, the lights that are streamlined in the center, and it has a nice flow to it. I think the only missed thing they did there was that when I put it on race mode, I feel like all those lights should turn red and let you know that the entire car is ready to go. The sound system in this car, this is a Meridian system. This is on the higher end trims. It doesn't have the best sound, but it does 
certainly kick your ass. The funny thing is, is in the audio settings, there's bass, treble, and subwoofers. So they're really pushing their bass on you and it works. The entire car shakes and rumbles and rattles and rolls. This thing is bumping you sweet beats the entire time and it really has a way of filling up. It really envelops you inside the cabin. I feel like I'm in some form of uh, metal igloo. Yeah, that's what you're trying to accomplish with these luxury cars here. He's trying to get that feeling of separation with the rest of the world. I gotta say, I think this car looks better than this Lexus to the right of me, than that Infiniti. Looks better than the Mercedes for sure. This is one of the better looking SUVs, and I think it's those headlights. Those headlights, they put that little dip of metal just over the front, and it just gives it this look, this fierce look to it which when you're in regular drive mode doesn't make much sense, but boy, when you're in that race mode, and I imagine when you have that six or eight cylinder, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Is it Jaguar or Jaguar? I say it like the animal, because I'm an animal when I drive this thing. Overall, this was one of the better, newer cars I had driven recently, and it didn't make me feel like the tech was in the way of what I wanted to do, which was drive. While I'm not really one to care about SUVs, this Jag does what it's supposed to pretty well. This four-cylinder turbo option comes in just under 300 horsepower, and it has enough oomph to push your way through traffic and have some fun all at once. I can only imagine what the 380 horsepower six-cylinder and 550 horsepower eight-cylinder engines feel like. I bet they're completely bonkers compared to this. If you're in the market for an SUV in this price range, I'd put it on the list. If you like what you saw here, hit the like and subscribe button. If not, let me know in the comments. I'm always open to feedback. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more. Please, give me my shift knob. Oh, thank you. Silly feature. I don't know why I like it so much. <laughs>